Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. <laughs> Yeah, we didn't. Oh, we didn't have bumper music. I didn't even think about that. All right, next time, whenever I write my next book, we will have bumper music. I promise. And today's cool fact of the day. It wouldn't be an episode without a cool fact of the day, right? Well, you've heard laughter is the best medicine, right? It is a proven fact, and frequent, wholehearted laughter actually helps you fight off disease because it lowers your cortisol levels. By the way, this doesn't work if your cortisol is too low. Then if you laugh, you'll actually get sick, so you need to hold your laughter in. Okay, that wasn't a cool fact of the day, but it should be. <laughs> and if you like today's show, you should do what I always ask you to do, which is go onto iTunes and just click like and give us a good review and things like that because, well, that's what tells other people that Bulletproof Radio is worth listening to. And if you are in today's live studio audience, and this is so you listening in your cars or at work know that this is a live episode of Bulletproof Radio recorded here in Austin. Um, yeah, I totally appreciate those positive reviews. <coughs> no, I'm coughing, in case you didn't notice. <coughs> There's two reasons I'm coughing. One is that right before I came on stage, I used one of the most studied, most powerful smart drugs out there. It's actually called nicotine. <laughs> no, I have never smoked. Smoking's gross. <laughs> Smoking's bad for you. It will kill you. No, but I did use nicotine. That's why it was funny. Oh, look at that. Shocked look. All right, here's the deal. Microdose nicotine. I don't sell this. I don't make it, but I use it. This is not legal in the United States. Nothing good ever is. <laughs> it's approved in Canada and Europe, and it's one milligram of spray nicotine. So it's about 1 20th of what's in a cigarette. And you can use that under your tongue. And it actually improves a lot of cognitive function. So I can tell you every great book ever written was written on coffee, nicotine, always those two, and quite often alcohol and or sometimes cannabis, but usually those books the author just thought they were great. <laughs> now, that I completely distracted you because I swallowed my nicotine ahead of time. What a faux pas. I would like to introduce today's guest who's sitting here laughing. And the fact that he's sitting here and laughing is actually really good for my ego because John Resig is co-founder of Resignation Media which means that he's responsible for the website called The Chive. Chive <laughs> now, I think most of you have probably seen The Chive content because The Chive is the number one humor website in the United States. Holy crap. 30 million users a month. And there's a whole network of sites like the Chivery, which is a huge e-commerce business. They run a charitable division that raises awareness and funds for people with just different problems who really need help. So very, very successful entrepreneur and someone who's really hacked this how do we make things funny sort of thing. I'm, I'm still working on that. I've got him to laugh three times. And that was because I threatened them. <laughs> uh, I just want you to introduce me to my parents. I want you to walk into Fort Wayne, Indiana and say, Mr. and Mrs. Rezig, uh, your son has the number one website in the world, 30 million users, and then just to go in to, you know, pour some sugar on me by Def Leppard and <laughs> parents. It, here's the funny thing. Uh, my in-laws still think I'm unemployed. They, they really do. Like, they're like European doctors, and like, I don't have a job, so. Yeah. You've done so well for yourself, though. <laughs> They're still worried that they're going to have to pay for me with their retirement. <laughs> True story. <laughs> and I know they're not listening, otherwise they'd be like, he has a job? <laughs> All right. <laughs> the world is awesome. And, well, one of the reasons that you're on stage is that 
We couldn't find anyone better, and we're in Austin. <laughs> yeah. McConaughey's hosting a thing across the street the other night. <laughs> Till my employees are like, how did Dave get you? I'm like, McConaughey's doing a thing across the street. Bullock passed. Now you get me. And what uh, the, the real reason here is actually has nothing to do with the chive or humor or all that. It's just because I like True Blood, and you're actually Deputy Kevin Ellis on True Blood. Wow. You did that. You did your research. You know, Wikipedia is so good these days. <laughs> I did. I was on, I was on uh, HBO Vampire Show called True Blood for seven years until I got my head bitten off in the, in the last episode. That was a sad episode, it I, was I, I, I got to say. It was really sad. <laughs> <laughs> but what's cool is you're running a business out of Austin with mm -hmm. 170 employees. Mm -hmm. You're reaching huge numbers of people and, and making them laugh, which is something unique. So I haven't had someone with just a strong entrepreneurial and an actor background on the show. And I wanted to talk with you about some of the things you do around humor and also just some of the things that have made you a really successful entrepreneur because many of the episodes are maverick scientists and, and people who've written books and all that. Yeah. But you're reaching more people than almost anyone else. There aren't even a lot of TV shows who have the reach of, of the properties you build. So I think we'll have a really fun conversation about that. Yeah. you you. You did your shit. You're good. What do you want to know? All right. If someone has not heard of the chive, how do you describe that bizarre octopus tentacle thing you built? It's a really good question. The chive is basically three H's. It's humor, hotness, and humanity. So good combination. Yeah. So you can make people laugh, and that gets them in the door. And then uh, a little cleavage never hurt anyone. I think okay. uh, Eleanor Roosevelt said that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt didn't say that. It, it was Helen <laughs> Keller. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the chive has a pulse. It's got a heartbeat. It's got a community. Not, not unlike what you have here, which a lot of people wish they had, where people, you know, who could show up, we have chive meetups, and you're doing your, your first book tour with, and it's a risk, right? Oh yeah. You've done successful books before, but haven't put butts in the seats. That's, a, that's the tough thing. That's a testament to, to what you've done, right? So the humanity, yeah. Thanks. And, and thanks to all of you for coming and being a member of the audience, just showing your support. It, it actually means a lot. It does, it's a cool thing. So if you can get a community around, you can't get a community around cleavage and funny photos. You can get halfway there. You can get the whole way there if you form a community around a cause. And the cause for us is Chive Charities, helping the orphan causes of the world, our veterans, things like that, where you can go to the Chive and you know you're gonna see some great funny photos, you're gonna laugh, you can see some cleavage, but at the end of the day, you gotta be a citizen. And that's why the Chive works. So to the Bulletproof team listening, uh, more cleavage, please. On the <laughs> I didn't know what I was getting myself into until the Bulletproof team was like, would you like uh, a water, a coffee? And I'm like, mm. and they were like, you want booze? And I was like, yeah! <laughs> Backstage, you're, you're good to go. I didn't tell you what was in the booze. <laughs> Butter. <laughs> I, I don't know why it feels so good whenever I make him laugh. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody like, wow. backstage is talking about butter. <laughs> Am I missing something? <clears throat> yes. <laughs> yes. They really are, though. <laughs> Someone's talking about feeding his baby butter. I'm like, <laughs> that's, that's great. <laughs> Tell me you've had Bulletproof Coffee. Oh, yeah, because you guys are on Main Street, or you're on Navy Street. Yeah, or Main Street, yeah, in Venice. In or Venice, near, near Venice, you, yeah, Santa Monica. But you're on Main and Navy, Yeah, on the corner. Right. Yes, I go in there and I you, drink it. So that's butter. Fuck, that's, that's <laughs> what makes it so good. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just putting it all together right here in front of everyone. <laughs> I really am. All right. This is definitely more like a humor show than a podcast. No, I'm sorry. No, no this is awesome. All right. Back to the chive. Yeah. Chives and butter are good together. <laughs> but they are in the allium family, just so we're really clear <laughs> on that. So if you're a Jainist or really practicing to avoid body odor, you shouldn't go to their website. Thank you. Please. <laughs> All right. 
you started in 2008, mm -hmm. and here we are about nine years later. Yeah. 2008 was, was a year when one of our audience members was born. One of our young audience members, hello there, young, man, young lady. Hi, what's her name? We took a, a selfie together. It was one of the best selfies of the entire tour, so thank you. And I'm happy you were born in 2008. That's the right year. Now, okay. thank you for making us feel old. Now, in 2008, the country was kind of having a big financial crisis. Mm -hmm. It might have been caused by your mom, I'm not sure. Just kidding, she didn't do it. <laughs> She's a nice mom. Now, you got a bunch of people who are not so happy. I remember I was, uh, in fact, I was about to get a lab testing company that my wife and I had started. Uh, we literally had investors lined up to write us a check, and the fit hit the shan, so to speak, and the investors pulled out, and so we're like, well, I guess we're not gonna be doing that. <laughs> And it was just kind of a, a, an uncomfortable time for a lot of people. What made you start something right then? Uh, part happenstance, but that was what allowed the chive to become the chive was you could, you could trace 2008 back to the Great Depression in the late 20s. Uh, two things in the Depression remained the same. People still went to movies, they still bought peanuts and popcorn and they still bought chocolate. It means they wanted to be happy. So when we started The Chive, we built it as the happiness website. Like somewhere you could go to just get away from the general malaise and, and the things that were <coughs> not going well in the country and just have a good laugh. We were the online equivalent to going and getting a drink of Jack Daniels or having a chocolate bar. And those things have stood up through every economic collapse that you'll ever have, is just some, they need some sort of escape. And so we were positioned at that time to thrive, you know, I, I, and we did. It was a hit kind of out of the gates. So is this because you had strategic mastery and wisdom or you just wanted to do it? No, it was a happy accident. We, I was, okay. we were really broke. <laughs> <laughs> right. You got nothing better to do. Yeah, we wanted to quit our day job. So that's what we did. How long did it take you to quit your day job? Uh, my brother took about two years because he's like the left brain kid that doesn't believe anything good's ever going to happen. Right. For me, I was just guns blazing like, we just made $10,000, you know? Nice. We're going we're gonna to be rich forever. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we, I quit my day job right away. But that's what everyone wants to do is that mo I have a picture though that my favorite picture is the moment I got my brother to buy into quitting his day job and he's drinking a red stripe and he sent me a picture of him like I'm, I'm out and that's a, that's a real moment I, that's still my favorite moment my favorite moment is my brother quitting his job <laughs> that's kind of sad <laughs> how is it running a sizable company with a family member <coughs> Man, you did your homework. This is wild. Um, I think it'll be one of the great honors of my life to, to run a company with your siblings. You can't choose your siblings and you don't always get along. And I didn't always get along with my brother because he's totally different. But if you think about the chive, what it is is that he, my brother builds the stadiums and I get to go out and play ball. Okay. So we have completely complementary skill sets, which is nice. All right. So I'm going to ask you all the hard questions that, that I don't really hear people ask. So you guys have made some money, like a little bit more than $10,000 at this point. Yeah. Right? Did you have all the stuff set up ahead of time with contracts and payments and all that stuff so that that didn't become an issue? Because I've seen that tear families apart. Oh, my brother and I have never, I don't think we've ever fought over money. Nice. So you guys just have that kind of relationship. So. Yeah, that was never a thing. That's the coolest part, man. I heard a stat the other day, I'm not kidding, that uh, people who die, if you're a rich old dude and you die um, and you have four kids, two of the kids will spend all of the money you will them within 18 months. <laughs> and the exception to that rule is only 1%. Wow. Uh, which means a lot of people place money above all things and no one in my family did. And uh, we never had a, I never had a fight over money with my brother in my life. Now, now, you're an actor before you became an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Why do so many actors suck as entrepreneurs? <laughs> they, they suck less than doctors, by the way. 
<laughs> Some of them don't. I mean, yeah, a lot of them blow pretty hard. I, Some I, of them are great, no doubt, but like it seems like the exception, but they're crazy successful. Yeah. There's a lot of them who are like, I've got to do a business. And you're like, no, you're not. Well, you got to work it. I think I was a bad businessman at first. You were okay. I was reading internet for dummies like everybody else, but I read it. <laughs> I was writing it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what were you doing before you became you? I was a tech entrepreneur. For, oh, that's right. First guy to sell anything over the internet. I invented e-commerce, dude. Yeah, I read your... <laughs> I didn't. I'm not Al Gore. I read your wiki. <laughs> yeah, it was... Uh... <laughs> You're born successful. No, I was born angry. Yeah, you're all right. I don't know. Yeah. All right, so it just kind of came naturally. You, you, you sort of seem like you're letting things happen. Like I, I want to know that there's a class of entrepreneur who succeeds because they planned everything and they push really hard mm -hmm. and like they're they're like that's what they do. And you can do this sort of like running away from failure sort of thing. You don't strike me as that type. You're like I just wanted to do this. It seemed like it'd be fun. It'd be uplifting. No, you got to right? you got to see the playing board for what it is and that means you have to be a pretty far-sighted guy. I I can to answer your question, I remember I remember that in November 9th of 2009, 99, we had our first million visitor day and I knew that was the day that we would have 1 million people on the chive. Wow. And I knew that was that I could afford to live in a condo and uh, I could buy a car then, and then I would just be okay. I don't think after that day that I've ever checked in on how many people have come to the Chive. I couldn't tell you. I've heard six or seven million a day come, wow. and we have monthly KPIs that I completely ignore. It's like, I don't, I don't wanna know. I wanna be able to make decisions not based on those numbers. But your brother's the numbers guy. Yeah, he loves them. Um, but, it, but he's a good he's a good guy. He doesn't he doesn't get that in the way of the creative process. Creativity is what drives the chive. I find that the numbers guys usually listen to like elevator music, beige cubicles, stuff like that. Is is he a little bit more like that than you? No, I'm the one who listens to Kenny G a lot. He's more <laughs> Rage Against the Machine guy. I think I like him already. Yeah. What do you listen to? I rage Against the Machine. Well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like slow jazz. So, <laughs> okay. All right. So, now that you're at this point where there's a lot of people want to talk to you, when you're a successful entrepreneur, this, mm. this happens in general. They, they, they all want to pitch their deals to you. And there's, there's literally thousands of things vying for your time and attention. Mm -hmm. How do you manage that? It's really easy. I look for persistence no matter what level of success you are. So, you want people to pester you? Yes. I like people who bother me. Like that's how I know that you're on the up and come, or if you already established that you still want more. Like you can still email me at johnatthechive.com. All my community knows this, and I'll I'll put that out there. Like you can email me at johnatthechive.com if you've got an idea, you you want to send me your resume. I'll see everything. What I want to see is if you're going to come back to the well twice, and we actually did it. The metrics on that are only about one percent of people will come back twice to say following up and the metrics on that for the third time which is going to get you called in and you just that's got to change that. after that like this is <laughs> six times but yeah now it's going to go after that is is like uh it's like 50 percent of that one percent will come back for the third time once you hit me the third time i'm like someone wants it i don't know who they are or sometimes i do but they want to do business because we don't have to do business with anyone at this point if we don't want to like now I just want to know who's persistent enough to bother me enough to want to get in the door. Yeah. As a tech guy, I got to tell you, there's automated software mm -hmm. that every inside salesperson uses that is scripted to send, hey, and then they have timing that's measured to see when you're going to open the email based on when you open the last one to, to send you this like similar message. Following up, hey, did you get my last message? It's all automated. So, why you ru you ru <laughs> I think you might be right. I am right. <laughs> <laughs> we don't use that at Bulletproof. That stuff is horrible. No, but it's been used against me. People are gaming the system. If it's a salesperson and you're getting emails like that, you should just delete all that crap. Yeah. <laughs> so 
If it's someone wanting a job, you should probably answer it because few job seekers use that software. That's, that's fair. What are the dreams are you here to ruin, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> Can we talk about butter again? Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't. Why is everyone talking about butter? <laughs> All right. So basically, you give your attention to automated software mm -hmm. is your productivity hack of the day. <laughs> no shame in that. I did not. <laughs> That said, you also have lots of people who want to meet you. Uh, do you work with an assistant? Do you read all your own emails? My assistant's here. All yeah. right. The I was my assistant, Annie, Annie the nanny, was here. And she's out there somewhere. And she, she knows my, my whole company knows more about you than I do. Because Annie was like, you know, are you, we're going to meditate. Are you going to miss the meditation? Nice. Or she's like, are you going to be in the, like, the brown room? And I'm like, it's called, it's called the green room, Annie. Uh, it's brown. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, she's, she's here. This is the first venue where we were required to have a riot fence in front of the stage because <laughs> Austin's so cool. I, I saw that, I'm like, what the, where are it's we? It's the kid. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So you have an EA, and you didn't say whether you actually read all of your own emails. You do? I do, yeah. How many emails a day do you get? 200. That's it? Yeah. And you give your email address out like this? Everyone. Wow. I yeah. think I get more than that. <laughs> yeah. You notice I said I think? Because I have people help me filter them, so I see the right ones. But you've got good people. Everyone backstage is really nice. Oh, I think so. I'm, I'm no, they are. Like, everyone that works here was, like, really yeah. sweet. In, in fact... This is a great time. There are 10 members of the Bulletproof team who have flown to seven cities over the last 16 days supporting the book tour and making all this happen, and a bunch more back at the office or back working from home who arranged for you guys to hear about this and all that. So you give them a round of applause. Yeah. Like I'm blown away by that. And they were telling me they got... Uh they all got on a plane in Denver last night, and they had to wake up at, at 5 in the morning and they're all still so chipper. Like if my employees woke up at five in the morning in Denver and flew here, they want to find like the nearest living thing and kill it. You know, like, but you're, you've got good people to work for you and apparently love butter, whatever that is. <laughs> it's, it's the Bulletproof Coffee. Yeah, I get it uh, now, I know. I, I'm just, I'm hearing that from the audience. But <laughs> now, I'm, I still feel like I haven't gotten to the root of this. Like you, you seem a little too happy-go-lucky for one of the top two executives, even at a humor website and a bunch of other things. So like really, most entrepreneurs have more stress than you're sending out here. So where's your stress? I think that's a good question. Um, what are you, Oprah? Uh, <laughs> it's what, what keeps me up at night. Uh, I don't know. We, we have a couple hundred employees. They got families. They got kids. Yeah. You know? That's a common thing. Yeah, it's the number one thing. It's the, no different for me. Like, if someone in my office gets pregnant, you got to... What's their blue like, cross, is it mine? blue is that... shield? It's definitely yours. Um, <laughs> and you got to find out what plan they have. And I think that's, that's the most important thing is the culture starts yeah. from the inside out, not the outside in. So you got to make sure they're taken care of. I don't think any CEO would tell you different. All right. Now, when you want to be extra productive on a day, what do you do? I will be honest with you. I, because I, I didn't know about some of your stuff, I'll, 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 I'll take brain fuel. <laughs> I will. I, 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 I'll uh, take a supplement. Oh, I'll, I'll give you a, a stack of stuff. Yeah, I did. I, yeah. Have, yeah we'll, we'll hook up after the show. But I mean, like, so, but, but generally, it sounds like, like, you don't, you know, wake up and meditate stoically on an ice cube, uh, you know, drink some green tea, no. uh, self flagellate, nothing like that. Uh, no, I mean, uh, that's kind of the cool part about being here is I'm just. Everyone else in the audience is, I'm just like you. Like, I'm, I, I'm in the batter's box for self-help, too, man. Like, I mean, what's, <laughs> what do I do at night? Chardonnay. <laughs> nice. I'll, you know? You could put butter in that. <laughs> <laughs> I like a buttery Chardonnay, so it's good. <laughs> but, like, I, that'd be a question for you. Like, no one needs a little help more than I do. I'm on crutches. I got to feed this thing. 
you know? It looks like a pretty good surgery. It is. I broke in 10 places. I don't know. You tell me, like, if I wake, if I could just mitigate my morning plan, which is right now, drink a real shitty cup of coffee, because Austin's coffee scene, as you guys know, isn't that great. Um, I, I think I might be able to fix that. Yeah, you go, to, you go to Austin Java, and you're like, shouldn't this be good? And it's oh, not. That's mean. I don't coffee, care. I don't care. people are, are, are good people. I'll only throw Austin Java under the bus, because <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> oh, God. What would you do? I wouldn't be mean to other coffee people. In that. They're trying. <laughs> Come on, that was worth a laugh. Oh. God <laughs> sake. Uh, that was called a neg. I, I, I learned that from uh, one of the pickup artist guys. It, it's not working. You guys saw the sign said laugh up behind me? It, it's, just, it's not working. All right. Now, that we've done our coffee shaming. So you, so you pretty much just chill a lot of the time. I'm getting that. How many hours a day do you work? Uh, a lot. But, you know, we invented the whole keep calm thing. So I think I, I go home and I, I check out sufficiently. You guys didn't invent that. That was the British subway. That's actually true. Um, <laughs> I was relying on you not to know. <laughs> What's next, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> I do like the shirts, though. I'll give you that. <laughs> All right. So you work a lot. And we t what keeps you up at night is keeping, uh, keeping uh, uh, responsibility and, and just serving your employee base. Mm -hmm. And you're the, the softer side of the business at, at, in terms of you're not the quant guy. And yeah. I, I'm still feeling like I haven't kind of got down to what you really do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I, I'm the head editor of the Chive and I do all of the marketing. So I'm, I'm the messaging the consumer-facing messaging of the chive. So if you see something on the chive that pulls your heartstrings, that's probably something that I'm good at. You know, All right. there's something that exists in the ether of what I do that is being a storyteller, and that's knowing everything from a seven-act structure to a three-act structure to being able to tell a story to people in three photos. So that's what I do. Okay. And the world will, you know, if you, if you read something like Story by Robert McKee, he'll, he'll tell you that in the future, you know, good storytellers um, and a good story well told will be more important than oil. So I can, I can clock a story really well. That's, a, that's, that's all I got. So that, that's kind of your superpower is telling a good story. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I got. I mean, really, outside of that, I'm a pretty bad lay. Um, <laughs> not great. You can't even walk. I mean, yeah, I can't walk. I'm a cripple. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Really sad. Thanks for peeling the onion layers away, Dave. Yeah, I, I think we've reached his core now. <laughs> yeah, I feel like we've both grown. <laughs> All right. I gotta ask you this. What? made you start a partnership with Bill Murray from Caddyshack to make a line of golf clothing when you run a humor website. Like, what the hell were you thinking? Like, that's the most nonlinear yeah. business move I've ever heard of. That'd be like me, I don't know, opening a tofu bar. <laughs> okay, good, yeah, <laughs> I believe you. Yeah, that, that was a joke, it's okay to laugh. <laughs> um, no, I, uh, we started selling all the Bill Murray t-shirts that you see out in the streets. Once upon a time, what saved our company was that the, the Chive was kind of successful out of the gate, but we had these huge hosting bills and we didn't know what to do. So we started an e-com website and started selling these pictures with Bill Murray on it. And we thought that would make, we print up like 400 t-shirts with Bill Murray on it. And we thought that'll sell over the next two years and it sold in like 10 seconds. Nice. So before you knew it, we were printing 30,000 of them and making a million dollars in a minute on Bill Murray t-shirts. And the moral of that story is we owed Bill Murray a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> so you try, but we're like from Indiana, we're trying to, we're not gonna stop. Like this is way too good right now. But you're trying to get a hold of Bill mm -hmm. Murray and all of the urban legends are true. He has an 800 number that you can call and he listens to it. <laughs> 
maybe once a month. And so we're calling Bill Murray and like, Bill, you see some you know, shirts on the street? You might want to give us a call. We owe you a lot of money. And then you called, he's got a producer, and we called him and his brothers, and we called them. He, the moral of the story is we knew, uh, he knew that we were trying to get a hold of him, uh, that we were being good boys and girls. Right. And that we, we, meanwhile, we're ferreting away millions of dollars to give <laughs> to Bill because we owed. That wasn't our money. Um, and we were using his image and likeness. And when, then one day Bill calls, and uh, that's funny because your secretary has that look on her face like, no, Bill Murray's on the phone. <laughs> As you say, put him on hold. <laughs> yeah, so, I, so I put Bill so I got to the phone real fast. And instead of Bill Murray saying, and the Bill I know now kind of shuts everything down. He said, he, he's fine with saying, don't do this, don't do this. But he got on the, we got on the phone, he said, look, I kind of like, I kind of like the shirt. Or like Bill, you knew John, I kind of like the shirt. Um, <laughs> and then we met in St. Augustine, Florida. He said, come sponsor my charity golf tournament. So he was like us, we do a lot of charity, Bill does yeah. more. And he was like, look, and we got to St. Augustine, he's like, you know, what did Bill say? You know, I, you know you, you're back to rent, John. I guess you got a little red on your ledger. And <laughs> give it all to charity. Wow. And, I was, and he didn't know. I was like, Bill, it's a significant amount of money. And, he's, and I told him, he said, well, I didn't expect it to be that much. <laughs> <laughs> but give it to charity. So that's the, and then that led to a relationship that we kind of found out that he's from Chicago, we're from Fort Wayne, Indiana, we're very like-minded. The Murray Circle's very small. It's very hard to, to get into that circle, but it's all about trust and, and whether he likes you or not, it's a handshake agreement. But I, I guess that is the Reader's Digest story of, of Bill Murray, is that he, we owed him a lot of money and, and he said, go ahead and give it to, to a charity. Millions of dollars. Yeah. That's, now, if, if you're listening to this and, and you think that when people make a lot of money, it's because they're jerks uh, or they're bad people or because they think they're better than you, I, over the last few years, I've had a chance to meet multiple, multiple billionaires and some of just incredibly successful people. And there are a few jerks in there, but not usually. Most of them are, are upstanding people who are going, how do I use this to help? Like, they actually care. And uh, I've seen that in Hollywood. I've seen it everywhere. Like, like it, it's it's actually reaffirms my belief that people are basically good, <laughs> which is kind of cool. I, I, yeah, I have nothing to add to that. Very well, very well put, Dave. Thanks for not ganging up on me about the coffee and the butter and everything. Uh, uh, well, well, I'm saving that for later. <laughs> <laughs> now, it sounds like the real way you got started on that was uh, ask forgiveness, not permission. That is true. Uh, yeah. So how could aspiring young entrepreneurs, now, by the way, I got my, my start, the very first product ever sold over the internet was a caffeine t-shirt that I made. So the first e-commerce ever, truly it said caffeine, my drug of choice. I sold t-shirts to 14 countries the first month before the web browser was created. I didn't make millions of dollars, but I did pay some of my tuition that way. <laughs> so it was, was kind of cool. We hadn't invented the word e-commerce, so it just like, it wasn't quite at your level there, but I'm like, damn, my timing was really off. <laughs> No, it wasn't. It was perfect. <laughs> and I totally agree with you. Like, ask, yeah. you know, ask permi permission later. Is it, <laughs> that is a good quote. We did. <laughs> okay. All right. So if you had uh, someone listening, I'm sure that, that this episode is going to attract a, a lot of, of young entrepreneurs who are looking to get started. And actually, t-shirts are probably the easiest way to get started that there is except for the second you make it, someone's gonna copy it without permission, even if you register the crap out of your trademark in 5,000 countries or whatever. It, 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 like, there's, there's just a blatant copying of things. But it's still a good way to do it. What advice would you offer to uh, a, young, a young entrepreneur who's like, look, I, I, wanna, do, I wanna do what you did? Uh, oh, you've gotta be willing to fail. How many times did you fail before you knocked it out of the park? Oh, I, I don't fail. I don't believe in it. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Every night before I tuck my kids in, I, I ask them three things that they're grateful for and one thing they failed at. Yeah. And if they don't have something they failed at, I'm like, oh, it wasn't a very good day. Like, you, you didn't do anything to learn. Like, you know, 
Could, tomorrow, do you think you might have a fail? <laughs> like, seriously, I, I love that. that you say it because that, that's what it's all <laughs> yeah. about. The first hire, every employee gets, uh, you know, that we hire comes into my office for five minutes, and I just let them know, look, you got to be willing to fail here. Okay. Like, and, and not like, not etch a sketch into the world failure, but like get out and let me see a failure. Because if you're, what's a good example? Okay, so if you're facing Justin Verlander and you're a rookie, right? you're gonna strike out. You, there's nothing that's gonna stop you from striking out. You're going against one of the best pitchers that ever lived, and you're stepping in the batter's box, and you're a rookie, and you're going down. All the coach is looking for is if you're swinging the bat. Like, did you go down swinging? That's all that matters to me. Like, I just want my employees to go in and fail. Tell, tell me about the first time you fired someone. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, I'll tell you my favorite time. There you go. That's good. Was we give lunches to everybody at the office. Like, if you go to the chive at noon, lunches come out. Like, you get catered lunches. And I learned that from Hollywood, from being an actor. Yeah, yeah. Like, food is important You're in a little Hollywood. better than crafty, though? A lot better than crafty. Okay. Sometimes we roll in, like, a food truck. It was really nice. And one of the kids, who will remain unnamed lodged a complaint because he left at 12 to go do something else and he came back at 12:30, and no one had saved a plate for him here is this commodity that he was not entitled to in any way that he went to our hr and complained <laughs> about and i remember thinking oh my god i'm gonna i'm gonna throw him out of this place like a bouncer <laughs> and i totally did and this last thing <laughs> It was like, do I get to com keep my computer? I, I bought that computer. No. <laughs> get out of here. Like, that's you little spoiled shit. <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> Man. The uh, HR laws in Texas are lax. They are. <laughs> right to work state. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, that might have been an easy fire. Tell me about a hard fire. Oh, man. Um, someone who's really good at certain things but not good at their job makes me sad. Like someone who's really talented. Like we have our whole e-commerce division. We've got people that one person was very good at design, just one of the most brilliant creative minds I've ever seen. But she had to also be in charge of product and ordering and be the numbers person, mm -hmm. you know, at the same time. And then you have to let, letting someone go that, that was r truly great and didn't just didn't belong in her position is really sad. I, I don't like seeing that. Letting someone who just doesn't do their job is fine with me. And we, we don't fire too many people, but letting someone with talent go is sad. Yeah, that, that's one of the hardest things uh, as an entrepreneur. Yeah. You know, just because, you know, it's just unpleasant. And that's an area where a lot of young entrepreneurs fail. Like, I, I just can't do it. <laughs> so then the person who isn't doing the job and is crying about lunch stays around and keeps crying about lunch. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> he didn't stay around, though. Yeah. I, but see, because you, you made the tough call. In that case, it wasn't so tough. But with the other one, it, it was tough. No, I mean, do you, you've got to have one. Now it's your turn, Dave. Hey, I, I'm the interviewer here, man. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you've got to have one. Well, I mean, I, I've had a a long career in, in Silicon Valley and and one of the things that happens as companies grow I, I was a co-founder of a, a business unit that grew to 1500 people from three people in three years oh, hyper growth yeah mm -hmm. and that was just the craziest thing because check this out I have like a flying cricket on my crotch it's it's I totally in, just looked at your crotch and I've been that's, just, that's an I've been looking for an excuse right and this Thank Dr. You. Barry was doing his, yeah. his work, and I'm resonating with power. Yeah. And I, <laughs> unfortunately, I got the insect attractive genes. But all right, you're asking me about some kind of good question. Yeah, I want to hear like what if you all go right, through so, hyper growth, you've yeah, got here, there's here's, a, what happens. Here's what happens: you bring people in, and you can only hire so well. You can only hire so fast, and so you bring people in, and you're like you have these 25 job functions, and then 
two weeks later, like, actually, you can only have 12 of those because we got to hire someone else to do the other 12 because they're growing too fast and yeah. you can't do it. And by the way, tomorrow, you only have six of those. And tomorrow, you only have three of those. And, and then one of the things that happens is you get people who are like, but I want it all 25 because I have the ring of power. <laughs> right? The conch shell. Yeah. yeah. And so those are people who feel a lot of emotional angst and end up usually either quitting or getting walked out over that because they have the opposite attitude of, of the, the real pros who scale. They're like, thank God, <laughs> I couldn't do a great job at all these things. Like, please get this crap off my plate. I don't need the power. I want to do what I do really, really well. So they're willing to take one for the team and do 10 things because it's a hyper growth environment, but they're also willing to concentrate and they don't, they're not empire building. They're, you know, they're, they're, doing, they're, they're doing what's right for the company that allows them to focus so they can actually relax because we feel good when we do good work and we feel crappy when we do crappy work because we're spread too thin. And so it's, it's that division between, am I doing quality work that's, that I like and am I just doing everything? And so I, I found that, that during that stage of hyper growth, it was the people who had to do everything. You can't do everything when you're growing really, really fast. It, it's all about becoming more specialized over time. It may be different in a slower growth company. I don't know. That's really, you're like the adult version of the person I want to read me a bedtime story. Because <laughs> I was awesome. just transfixed on you for a second. Wow, was it the cricket that did that? No, it was, just, it was you're right, by the way, but like it's, it's like Morgan Fer Freeman first and then you to wow. read me a bedtime story. That's really. I, th I think yep. that's my new podcast, the Bedtime <laughs> Stories for the Chive. Do you, like, listen to his cadence and his tenor. It's really good. Like, it's almost like iambic pentameter in which you, you work. I, I've been working on my street rapping skills, and it's coming through into my... No, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I have no skills there whatsoever. <laughs> no, not at all. all right. <laughs> so, but I, I, I answered your question there, but it's... It's one of the things that, that I don't get to interview entrepreneurs about, like what, what goes through their head and really what they feel when they're going through like the really tough decisions. But you've gone through some pretty rapid growth, mm -hmm. not like that hypergrowth.com crazy time, but uh, yeah. still in terms of, of traffic and revenue and all that. And, and I know uh, you're kind of painting a picture and because of your role as, as a kind of chief storyteller, it, it might be different if I was to talk to Leo about it, but I, I do know that there's that there's some tough choices that you make in there. And, and mm -hmm. what I'm looking for is, what do you do for yourself when you're facing the hard choices, the tough choices? Like, like what what gives you the power to do that? What gives you the the resilience to do that? I I know what we're bad at at the Chive. We're not very good at hiring managers. And the number one reason that you quit, anyone quits their job, is that they just can't stand the person that they work for. So. The, We've gotten a lot better of, uh, at it over the years, but if you get someone like we're, we were young and we're young, so if you get someone who, who's who's in there who's like you know 45 or 50, you're naturally like oh you know things, you're you're you you get what's going on, but you need good managers. That's what my brother would say. I know that's his answer is that you have to get really good managers who care about putting their employees on a on a growth plan like giving them a runway to succeed giving them as much ceiling as possible like that's what i deal with every day is like every employee at my company wants to be here and here and here and that requires growth and growth and growth so i mean that, that'll keep you up at night you know yeah. what's my next move i don't know <laughs> <laughs> but you want to empower your employees and it starts at the managerial level so have you done a lot of managerial training None. Okay. <laughs> I just get, take them out and I get them drunk and I just kind of I kind of eyeball it. <laughs> <laughs> that is, by the way, a very common entrepreneurial strategy. <laughs> like, like that wasn't a bad answer at all. Yeah, it's an honest answer. We we just give them coffee, but it's it's similar. <laughs> it's got butter in it, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I only went to that place on Navy Street. It is on Navy Street. Yeah, isn't it's right it? on the corner there. Yeah. And I didn't know what the secret ingredient was. I'm very passive. <laughs> All right, well, that, that's actually cool. So these are things that you've probably never heard on Bulletproof Radio. And I, I, in fact, just tell me by like, kind of raising your hand, is knowing what goes on in the mind of like a crazy successful entrepreneur of interest to you? Like, like it's okay if you don't raise your hand, but all right, it's cool. So most, most people, yeah, and I'm hoping if, if you're listening at home or in your car, uh, that this is also the kind of stuff that's interesting because this is 
despite a present appearance, is a, a, a really successful human being. <laughs> And I, I enjoy getting asked these kind of questions. It, it's, uh, it's satisfying for me. And, and I've got one more question for you now that I've insulted you and probably some of your family, your, your fashion designers, things like that. If someone came to you tomorrow and they said, I want to perform better at everything that I do, given your entire life, like, like all the things you know, what are the three most important pieces of advice you have for me? What would you offer them? The three advices? Th three most important things just to tell me, like, I want to be better at everything I do. Don't be overwhelmed by the gravity of the moment. Start at the beginning. Okay. Stair step it out would be the first thing I, I, I would do easily because you can be, everything that you want to be in life is sort of like right in front of you. There's a huge nebulous of it, but it's got to start with tying your shoes in the morning and taking, you know, one step towards your goal and eventually you'll reach it. Um, and then you have to be completely passionate about it. Like you gotta, I was, I was blessed, I think, in knowing what I wanted to do in life. You know, did you know what you wanted to do? Like by the time you were 30, did you know? Uh, I just wanted to break stuff that was dumb. <laughs> we, we broke the telecoms, that was the first one. <laughs> and and uh, you certainly did that. <laughs> But yeah, you gotta be you gotta be real passionate about it because you're not gonna want to take the steps forward towards your goal if you lose that inertia trying to get there. Like there's not a single time that went by when I was trying to get the chive off the ground that I had even one percent in the back of my mind. Eh, what's my plan B? And some people do, and I I don't spite them for that. I should have a plan B, but <laughs> I didn't. Um, and the next is just all, you know, always treat people like you'd want to be treated. I think oh, you, you, I, I can see it's not, it's, it's an altruism. And I saw it backstage with the people that you hire. Every single one of them gets along. They all care. Everyone asked me yeah. if I wanted something else. Like three people, if I asked, you know, do, I, like if I wanted Pellegrino by the third one, I was like, I'm fine. I got my own Pellegrino, you know? <laughs> Sorry. But like that, how cool is that, right? Yeah. So those are the three, I mean, those are the rudiments of, of success. And then once you, once you get through that, you're going to be fine. You're going to make a lot of mistakes. But as long as you're aware that you're not better than anyone else that works for you, then you're, you're going to be fine. And I saw that backstage with you, and that's why there's people here. And I, that's very cool. Well, thanks a lot for being on Bulletproof Radio. Uh, would you guys give it up for John Rustig from The Chive? <laughs> You might be the only guest I've ever had out of maybe 400 where I don't really have to say, tell people where they can find you. Because yeah. like 30 million people a month already know, <laughs> but you're at thechive.com. I'll do it, www.thechive.com. All right, John, and thanks for your charitable work as well and, and for the other things you're doing that make the world a better place beyond uh, just making people laugh. So hey, I appreciate thanks it. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it, man. Fun. Enjoy what you do. All right. <laughs> Does somebody have my crutches? <laughs> because, because I can't leave. I, I could carry you off. Could you? Uh, yeah. And would but... you? Come on. <laughs> All right. There we go. Thanks, buddy.